when my lovely wife Vicky was uh, a little girl she had really quite bad eyesight uh, anything that was more than a few feet away for her looked kind of in blurry and uh, and indistinct and she remembers seeing a photograph that uh, her brother had taken of the garden. Uh, she was about five years old, and as she held the photograph in her hand, it all looked beautifully crisp and clear, uh, in perfect focus. But this wasn't the garden that she recognised. As she looked out at the garden from, uh, uh, from her house, uh, she could see a sort of a blur. I mean, she could see there were kind of leaves on the trees and there were sort of flowers here and there. But it was all a sort of a gentle sort of blur. I think she quite liked that sort of uh, the soft focus effect. Um, the truth was she thought the photograph was wrong. The reality was it was actually her eyes that were wrong. It was her vision that was wrong. It wasn't until Vicky was about 10 years old that she went to see an optician at the Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford that they realised how bad her eyesight actually was. The optician was amazed that she'd managed to survive as long as she had with such bad eyesight. As far as he was concerned, she wasn't safe to cross the road. The good news was that this vision could be so easily corrected with the right prescription uh, of glasses and uh, she started her high school years wearing some very trendy, at the time, uh, John Lennon style uh, gold rimmed glasses with lenses like milk bottle bottoms. Today we're looking at uh, a psalm written by a chap called Asaph. Uh, and Asaph was uh, reckoned to be one of the kind of the great songwriters, perhaps one of the worship leaders in the time of King David. And in this psalm, Asaph confesses to a serious bout of spiritual short-sightedness. He could see all too clearly what was happening around him, close to him, uh, but he found himself unable to see beyond that, the longer distance view, the more distant perspective. And what he saw made him really unhappy made him even feel kind of sorry for himself because what he could see so clearly was arrogant and wicked people living nice, comfortable, prosperous lives without a care in the world. In their prosperity, they'd become careless and complacent. They'd become proud and hard-hearted towards other people and towards the living God too. They'd become, this is uh, how Asaph describes them, but they'd become scoffers, acting maliciously, bragging and boasting, making outrageous claims. Worst of all, they had no respect for the living God. If they were challenged about the way they were living, they would just say, well, how would God know? Or does the Most High know anything? And Asaph begins to compare himself with these people. Here he is supposedly somebody of some stature, some importance in the Jewish community, a, a writer of, of uh, worship songs for, the, for the, uh, uh, the sanctuary. But he is suffering difficulty and challenges in his life. He feels almost as if he's being punished every day for the way he's trying to live, serving the Lord. He's not being blessed that, uh, you know, this is what he expected, blessing for, for uh, seeking to serve the Lord. And so he begins to question if it's really even worth keeping his heart pure, if it's worth seeking to follow the ways of the Lord. And Asaph can see all this very clearly to the point where it almost causes him to fall away from God. But what he has lost sight of in his limited short-sightedness is the bigger picture, the more distant view, the greater goal, the more certain reward. His vision of these things has become blurry, indistinct, unclear, until something happens that changes everything for Asaph. His long distance view is restored and his perspective is changed. My lovely daughter is going to uh, read this psalm for us now. It's Psalm 73 and it begins with this wonderful positive proclamation of God's goodness. And then Asaph begins his story of spiritual short-sightedness restored by the grace of God to 2020 vision. As Sarah Jane reads, look out particularly for that uh, moment where everything changes for Asaph. Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. 
They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. Surely, then, in vain, I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream. When one awakes, when you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will take me into your glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge and I will tell of all of your deeds. I love Asaph's honesty in this psalm. He is ashamed of the way he was thinking. He knew it was wrong. But as far as he was concerned, whilst the wicked lived carelessly and comfortably, he was suffering even though he was really trying to live right with God and, and diligently follow the ways of the Lord. In verse 13 he says, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. And in verse 14, All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. For Asaph there was no longer any joy in serving the Lord. All his trying to live right and keep the Lord diligently seemed like hard, unrewarding work. But he knew this was dangerous thinking. Maybe this is something he reflects on as he writes the psalm. In verse 15 he says, If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. I'd have let you down. I'd have let your people down. But poor Asaph was confused and distressed by what he saw around him. In verse 16, When I tried to understand all this, I was troubled deeply. The process at work in, in Asaph's grumbling about the prosperity of the wicked went from, it isn't fair, to, so what's the point? What's the point in, in living a good life? Why bother with it? Why bother trying to serve the living God? If all I end up with is problems and, and difficulties, affliction uh, and suffering, whereas those that, that sort of go their own way seem to live a great old life. Thank you very much. And then something wonderful happens. Now, I read this psalm a few weeks ago as part of my sort of daily Bible readings. And I must confess, as I was reading the first part of it, I wasn't kind of really terribly engaged with what I was reading. It just seemed to be a, a sort of long tirade uh, against um, uh, the wicked, those that weren't following in the ways of the Lord. And then I got to verse 17 and suddenly I was with Asaph in his moment 
of realisation till I entered the sanctuary of God, writes Asaph. Then suddenly he saw everything differently. And I found myself almost sharing that moment with Asaph, remembering again how my vision, my perspective changes when I come into God's presence, when I draw near to him and focus on him. As he enters the sanctuary of God, everything changes for Asaph. He is no longer taken up with the ungodly, the wicked, but he finds himself in the presence of the living God. A new perspective fills his heart, a bigger vision, not just of the here and now, of not just of us and them, but God. God fills his vision. And he sees that the truth is the foundation on which the wicked are building their lives is fragile, shaky, insubstantial. Indeed, Asaph sees in verse 18 they are on slippery ground. It's like they're on ice, on like thin ice that could crack and break at any time and bring them down. Whereas his reward is God himself. And Asaph repents and returns to trusting and believing in the living God. He confesses in verses 20, 21 and 22, When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. His short-sightedness, his focus on the earthly, the temporary, the, the kind of bling of human existence, resulted in him becoming foolish like some senseless, dumb animal. But in the sanctuary... In the presence of the living God, with the furnishings and the articles of the, of the sanctuary, the house of God around him, his long distance eyesight is restored and he begins to see again what really, really matters. And so in verses 23 and 24, Asaph makes this beautiful confession. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by your right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterwards you take me into glory. As one commentator puts it, Asaph sees that he is grasped, you hold me by my right hand. He is guided, you guide me in your counsel and glorified that ultimately glory will come upon him as a follower of the living God. At the end of this psalm, Asaph is no longer complaining about these difficulties and hardships. But in verse 28, his confession is this, but as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. He was no longer taken up with the deeds of the wicked, but the deeds of the living God. He was no longer craving the easy, careless life of the ungodly, but rejoicing in a precious relationship with God. Rather than making money uh, and power and influence his goal, as the wicked did, he chose the sovereign Lord as his refuge. For Asaph, the turning point, the moment of truth, the moment of real truth, uh, the moment his long distance vision was restored and his perspective changed was as he entered the sanctuary, suddenly surrounded by the things that pointed him towards God. As I read this passage uh, those few weeks ago, in a sense I walked with Asaph through his experience and I was encouraged I felt my vision restored. I felt a few things kind of clicked back into place in my own heart. My perspective improved. It made me think about the, the ailment of spiritual short-sightedness that I, I know I can suffer from myself from time to time. Where can I go when my spiritual eyesight becomes cloudy? When all I can see is all that's wrong in the world, all that's wrong in me, all my problems and difficulties looming large where I find myself weary of my service for God, like Asaph, tired of trying to live well when other people seem to do what they like and, and seem to get away with it and seem to do quite well on it. Thank you very much. I end up tired of, of, uh, of pleasing God if I'm not careful. For me, I believe the most powerful antidote to spiritual short-sightedness for all of us really is to gaze upon the cross to remember the price paid for you and for me, to remember that we are incredibly valued, that we are truly loved. And it's interesting because as we see this sign through the lens of the cross, in fact, we realise we, we may see things perhaps slightly differently to Asaph, 
because we see that we were once numbered amongst the wicked, the, the ones that Asaph was having such difficulties with, that we were in truth no better than they were, living for themselves, living by their own set of rules, lives not submitted to the living God. Before we encountered Jesus crucified, Jesus risen again, Jesus as Lord and King, Jesus the death defeater, the sin slayer. Before all this, we were just like those people that Asaph despised so much. But at the cross, everything changed for us. I wonder if Asaph's sort of attitude to serving the living God changed too after his encounter with God in the sanctuary. But his diligent seeking of God, his work for God, might have taken on a fresh energy and enthusiasm. As we gaze upon the cross, another wonderful truth can fill our hearts. The truth of it is finished. This salvation that Jesus purchased for us is, pre is a, a precious but costly, incredibly costly gift. Freely given, gratefully received, eternally to be enjoyed. I wonder if you've ever been given a gift that sort of came with a little bill attached to it. Uh, the, the sort of you know the gift has been part paid for but you've got to you've got to sort of cough up the rest and I, I guess a few times uh, when the children were younger and they really wanted to get me a certain something for my birthday but didn't quite have the resources a deal would be struck whereby they'd get they'd buy the gift but I'd sort of um, add a little bit into the pot to fund it uh, and they'd get me something that I'd know I really I, I really wanted very kind of them uh, but it would cost me just a little but this gift of salvation, this gift that Jesus has, has provided for us at great, great cost to him, does not come with a requirement for a top-up from us. The price was paid in full. Jesus said, it is finished. I can add nothing to this gift. I can do nothing to deserve it, to earn it. I can only receive it and enjoy all that this gift unlocks for me and so at the cross my service for God this thing that Asaph was beginning to struggle with the the sense of I ought to do this I ought to do that changes to oh Jesus I so want to do this for you you have done so much for me you have traveled such a distance to reach me you have paid such a price to redeem me uh, you have gone to, to such lengths then you know what can I do but to honour you and love you and serve you uh, and give my life for you. And so in conclusion this morning, when you find yourself comparing your life with those around you, either favourably or unfavourably, I would, I would urge you return, return to the cross. Remember the price paid to redeem you. Remember that before you received this gift of salvation, you too were once lost and far from the living God. And when you find yourself trying to live well for God, uh, trying hard and trying kind of wrongly to live well for God, return to the cross. When it becomes about you and your efforts, if you like, return to the cross. Remember he has paid the price in full. You can add nothing to what he has done for you. Stop trying harder and instead try softer in humility and in gratitude. I guess the essence of Asaph's psalm as a, as a newer, if Asaph had been around today, this may have been a song that may have been one of his favourites, given his experience. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the cross. Lord, we thank you for Asaph, Lord, for his testimony, for his example to us, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for that moment of transformation for him. We thank you for your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for one another. All these things draw us and draw us towards you. But Lord, not more than anything, these things draw us to, to the cross, to the price paid for us, a price paid in full that puts a value on our lives. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the cross this morning and we ask you to help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, to keep gazing into your wonderful face, to keep our hearts full of gratitude and worship. 
in humility, to serve you with great joy. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening.